gentleman that you're going to hear from is our keynote speaker, and he's going to talk to you a little bit, I think, about what makes a safe place. And it's not gun-free zones, it's law-abiding citizens exercising their right to bear arms and being able to defend themselves, their family, and their neighbors. So Dr. John Lott is with us today, Dr. John Lott Jr. He's an economist and a world-recognized expert on guns and crime. He's president of the Crime Prevention Research Center. He's written nine books, including More Guns, Less Crime, The Bias Against Guns, Freedom on It, uh, Freedom on It, Freedom Omics. Tongue twister for me today. His most recent book is The War on Guns, and he holds a PhD in economics from UCLA, Dr. John Lott. Thank you for being here today, sir. Thanks very much. It's an honor to be here. I, I wanted to say, you know, anybody who's read my academic work knows that I think the police are by far the single most important factor for reducing crime. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Arrest rates, conviction rates, probably explain about 40% or so just by themselves in terms of variations in crime rates. But one thing the police understand themselves very well, and that is, even though they are extremely important, they almost always arrive on the crime scene after the crimes occurred. And that raises the question, what should people do when they're having to confront a criminal by themselves? And police are also probably the group in the United States that most strongly supports private ownership of guns. You look at survey after survey, they support national reciprocity, they support concealed carry, they support private ownership of guns. And the reason is, I think, that they know how important guns are in protecting themselves, and they understand when somebody's having to respond to a criminal by themselves, what's the safest course of action for them. Representative Keller earlier was talking about looking across countries and looking at guns and crime rates. One thing I'll just mention quickly, and that is every single place in the world that's banned guns, that we have crime rate data before and after the ban, has seen an increase in murder rates. There's not one single place where guns have been banned and even the murder rates remain the same, let alone falling. And it's a general point there, and that is, you know, it's not, it's not Washington, D.C. and Chicago, but even island nations, whether it's Jamaica or Ireland or the U.K., after guns have been banned, you've seen increases, often very large increases in murder rates. And why is that? It's a simple reason, and that is when you ban guns, or it's true for other regulations generally, you have to ask yourself who's most likely to obey the law. And if the law is primarily obeyed by law-abiding good citizens, not the criminals, so that you disarm law-abiding citizens relative to the criminals, you actually make it easier for criminals to go and commit crimes than it would have been otherwise. They have less to worry about. Uh, I mainly wanted to talk about uh, Representative Ortiz's discussion earlier about the PIC system here. He, he mentioned some of the costs that were involved. It's just not the fee that you have to go and pay the state for processing, but you also have to go and pay the licensed dealers for going, taking the time to go and conduct the background checks. In Pennsylvania right now, it's about $25 to $40, probably going to go from about $30 to $50 if the state increases in their cost of doing the background checks go up. You know, the question is, who gets stopped by having a $40 or $50 essentially tax on a gun? Well, I would argue, according to my research, it's the people who most benefit from having a gun to go and protect themselves. Poor people who live in high crime urban areas. Uh, Shanine, you know, she has kids, she's a single mom, she lives in a relatively high crime area. She'd already faced just two armed robberies. Why should we impose, if she wanted to go and buy a $300 gun, why should we impose what could be a 13 or 15% tax on her ability to be able to go and get a gun for protection? Here's the bottom line as an economist, what I would say, and that is, if you believe that background checks reduce crime, and I'm, I wish it was that easy, the thing is, who should pay for those costs? And as an economist, what I would say, it should be the people who benefit from that action. The law-abiding individual who's going to go out of their way to do a background check on a private transfer of a gun, they're not the criminals. 
they're not the ones that you have to go and worry about doing it. The, the people who benefit would generally be the general citizens overall. Why not pay for that then out of general revenue? Why make poor individuals in particular who are trying to go and buy a gun or people who live in high crime urban areas bear the entire freight of having to cover that cost? It makes no sense. Take some of that $7 million that the state's having to pay right now to go and conduct the background checks. If you're going to be saving by switching to the next system, by going and using part of that to cover people below the poverty level, or people that may be, you know, at, you know, twice the poverty level from having to go and pay those costs. Now, one of the things that's come out in recent court action in Pennsylvania is that the PIC system has essentially been used as a partial registration system here, where people who transfer a gun in the state, their records there of purchasing the gun are put into a, a licensing system. Here's the problem with that. You know, the claim is, is that registration and licensing is useful for reducing crime. The problem is, is every place in the United States or around the world that we can look at that's had registration and licensing, they can't point to a single crime that's been solved as a result of that process, whether it's Hawaii or Chicago or Washington, D.C., or Canada that's had registration and licensing on handguns since 1934, they can't point to a single case. In theory, if a criminal uses a gun in a crime, and they leave the gun at the crime scene, and it's registered to the person who commits the crime, you can go and trace it back to the criminal. The problem is multiple fold. One is crime guns are very le rarely left at the crime scene, and the few times that they're left at the crime scene, the reason why they've been left there is because the criminal's been either killed or seriously wounded, so you're going to catch them anyway. And the few times they are left there, they're not registered to anybody. And the couple times that they are registered, they're never registered to the person who committed the crime. So we go and spend a lot of money keeping track of this registration system there. You at least think that there'd be some debate if there could be hundreds of cases that you could point to where crimes have been solved. But if you can't point to any cases, it raises real issues. In Hawaii, uh, the Honolulu police chief there estimated it costs 50,000 hours worth of police time each year to go and handle the registration process. Since 1960, they hadn't been able to identify one single crime. Hawaii is kind of the ideal experiment. It's an island nation, relatively difficult to bring guns in and out of the state. And yet, despite all that massive resources that could have been used to lower taxes or hire more police or spend more money on education, they spend it, or, I mean, we know policing works. Why have police spend their time doing something they can't solve one single crime? Well, we know if we let police do traditional policing, lives could be saved. Crimes could be deterred by having these gentlemen and other police spending their times and efforts using resources to have them do what we know works there. So this is a costly system that doesn't really produce any benefits and makes it so that the most vulnerable people in our society, poor people who live in high crime urban areas, the ones who are most likely to be victims of violent crime, might be priced out of the ability to go and defend themselves and protect themselves and their families. So I thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it.